Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, Episode 71, The King of All Britons. In 1039, Griffith ap Llewellyn ruled Gwynedd. He had fought a battle against the English, including Edwin, Thurkill, and Alfgeet, and as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle called them, a lot of good men. This victory put Griffith in command of the north, and more importantly, defeated one of the greatest forces in English dominance of Wales since the death of Cadwaller, Mercia. It was 1039. The English were likely allies of Iago, and may have been brought in to help defeat the upstart. Their deaths at his hands left Griffith with a sterling victory to add to his reputation as a shrewd and successful heir to his father. Later, in 1039, he turned south. His interests in the southern kingdoms led him to attack Huel ap Edwin, and in at least two recorded battles in 1039 and 1041, the northern armies moved south, taking from the southerners first Caragidion. In his attack, Griffith, in fact, sacked the monastery of Llanbardan and obviously seized control fairly quickly and forced Huel out briefly, but did not completely get rid of him as he would again return and maintain control of Dyfed and Yustra Tui. We'll be mentioning that particular location quite a bit. For those of you who may not know, that is actually the modern-day Camarthen. Uh, In his victory of 1041, Griffith took Huel's wife, first as captive, then apparently to become his wife, likely at the death of her husband a year later. Once again, we have no idea who this lady is, and no name is ever revealed, and it of course leaves a ton of questions about who she was and what happened to her. Did she fall for Griffith? Was she just a pawn in a political power play? Or did her own survival instincts or ruthless sense of self-preservation take over? We really unfortunately have no idea. And the silence here is deafening. Unfortunately, we won't hear from her again because the next time we hear about his dealings with female relationships, it again will not include her. In 1042, the Vikings were causing trouble both to the South and the North Welsh kings. They would cause damage to Dofed until Huel was able to uproot them and while the men of Dublin successfully captured and ransomed Griffith. It may have been at this juncture that Hull made the deal with the Vikings or Ireland in the hopes of bringing an end to Griffith and his aggressive expansion. As in 1041, Hull appears to have been defeated by Griffith and his territory was then seized. In a last-ditch effort, he invaded once more, only to finally lose all of his kingdom and his life at the mouth of the Tui, dying in 1044, five years after Griffith came to power. Even as Doithbarth fell into his hands, however, Griffith would have no peace. In uniting the lands originally conquered by the descendants of Murphian, Griffith had conquered most of Wales, but the southeast was always just out of reach. In the past, because the kings and lords of Mercia continued to maintain dominance in the region, but this time they had been defeated and the Mercians were dealing with the English politics. Griffith may have been the first king to have the opportunity of uniting Wales under one banner. Under one king, for this one time, he was now facing down the sons of his father's former ally, Griffith ap Rodrik, which... The Book of Flandaf calls the King of Morganwy. The Welsh annals claim that in 1045 the two Griffiths had a falling out due to the great deceit and treachery of the sons of Rithric. This was important enough for even the sea version or the Mercian version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to mention, and in 1046 these two sides went into open warfare. We, of course, have no idea what the treachery was, but we do have a mention that the men of Griffith ap Llewellyn were in Istrig Tui. It was during this period that the Earl of Gloucester, Sven Godwinson, brother of the future King Harold, allied with Griffith, this king of North Wales. While there is no clear idea where Sven 
was during this period, it is felt that he was helping Griffith in the battle with his sons, Rydrik, and may have been in some way bringing English forces to bear. It appears at this stage that the English had become convinced that supporting Griffith in his war to unite Wales was something worth doing. It might be that the English were seeking to shore up their western neighbor before any problems could arise, especially with what appears to be a hostile enemy. By 1047, it appears that the men of the south were not fond of their new king, as around about 140 men were killed around the border territory of Istig Tui in modern-day Camarthen. This internal issue led Griffith to ravage Dovid and Yisterd Tawi, rather than taking it out on Morganwi, which likely means that the culprits were, as Professor Charles Edwards suggests, part of the kingdom and not outsiders. Likely, Charles Edwards also suggested that they may have been loyalists to the Murphian line in the south, who at this point were likely still pinning hopes and pining for the old kings. In 1049, a fleet of Norsemen from Scotland raided the south, causing widespread problems. The sons of Friedrich would, instead of taking them on, would actually seek a peace with them, and then in turn turn these raiders upon the English. And, in fact, there's a a battle which gets mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle between the east side and the Bishop of Worcester, Aildred, they actually defeated him and thus destabilized this area around Gloucester. And by 1051, with his Gloucester enemies in exile, Griffith uh, and a force of men raided Hereford and the surrounding area. While some scholars have suggested that it could have been the northern Griffith, Apluellen, seeking to finish off the Murphian line which existed in Hereford at the time, but it appears more likely that it was probably the sons of Rydrik who had been attacked and attacked two years previously in 1049 with their Norse invaders. And since this was a similar area near Gloucester, this may have been either Rhys or uh, Griffith attacking. And it seems to have been bared out because eventually Rhys himself would be captured and executed on order of King Edward in 1053. So, and in fact, his head was carried to Gloucester, which probably shows that it was in retribution for the things that they had done there. So the likelihood is this is that group that's caused this problem, not the Northern King. In the North, meanwhile, seems to have gone quiet. This period in the life of Griffith was a momentous one, while not well recorded, at least at this point. Over the 1050s, Griffith switched his allegiance from the unreliable Godwins, who had at times become on the outs with their king, to the powerful Leofric, who was the Lord of Mercia at the time. This change allowed Griffith to avoid getting on Edward the Confessor's bad side, And so when Sven's indiscretions got the whole of them exiled, they were able to avoid basically being in the crosshairs of Edward. Bringing Leofric, the Lord of Mercy, on board meant that Griffith had cover he needed to finish off one of the thorns in his side. In 1054, he killed his greatest threat as he attacked and defeated Griffith ap Rodrik and became the first king to unite all of the Welsh, the Cymru, under one banner. The king of the north was now the king of the Britons, in the words of the annals. And effectively, he was the king of Wales. There was no doubt from the north to the south in every part, he was king, and the first one of his kind at that point. In 1055, after the unity of Wales, Griffith was on his third wife. We did mention his previous wife. Unfortunately, we don't even know his first wife. Ailgith, daughter of Leofric's son, Althgar, the Earl of East Anglia. This alliance was critical at this juncture of Anglo-Welsh relations, as on the return of the Godwins, especially Earl Harold, Leofric's son, Ailthgar was in turn exiled and eventually came to Griffith for help. Griffith and his allies 
as the Welsh Annals would describe it, attacked Hereford, where the Britons, in quotes, won the day against the English. He would win another battle in 1056 against the Godwins, defeating Bishop Leo Garf, killing him and a number of his men. This would win him the day, but probably lose whatever power he had within the English court, as at this point the Godwins once again rose to power. At the same time, he did actually swear fealty to Edward the Confessor, meaning that his kingdom had returned to the English sphere of influence, as it had under the days of Alfred, when English ideals and the Welsh were united, at least, against a common enemy. After another exile for Elthgar in 1058, he once again invaded, this time with Griffith and Harold Hadrada supporting him returning him to his earldom of Mercia. Griffith may have felt particularly safe in that circumstance because with that buffer between him and the Godwins, he may have felt that he could grow and continue to progress. For a number of years after that, the Kingdom of Wales grew and Griffith continued to be a force in the English power struggle, so much so that the Godwins sought to assassinate him at Hrudland during the week of Christmas in 1063, the fact that Harold even tried that likely showed how powerful Griffith had become, and may have shown that the Mercian alliance had ended with the death of Aethgar in 1062. His son Edwin seemed less inclined to help his brother-in-law. Harold finally got his desired result, though. In 1064, he and his brother Tostig led an attack during the spring on one of the northeastern parts of Wales, while Harold went after Gwyneth. Harold's expedition seemed to have been a failure, but his brothers won back all the land that they had lost to the Welsh over the previous years. However, most of it actually ended up in the hands of their rival Edwin by 1066. But what could not be done by open warfare or straightforward assassination was finally accomplished by the Welsh themselves, as some turned on their king, killing Griffith in the autumn of 1064, or in some instances with the annals as early as 1061. The Ulster annal claimed that Griffith was killed by Canon Ap Iago, the son to the last Murfin king in Gwynedd, giving Harold a victory as he was able to defeat his bitter enemy, his one-time ally, and Wales would never again be fully united like it was under Griffith. Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Paul Brandis introducing my podcast, Countdown to Dallas. It's a fascinating, in-depth look at the seemingly unconnected events that led to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's based on my book of the same title. In that book and in this podcast, I go all the way back to 1939, when Lee Harvey Oswald was born into a troubled and dysfunctional family. I'll follow his transient and often violent teenage years and young adulthood, painting a fuller picture of the man who would later become Kennedy's killer. I also take a look at events unfolding in that era, like Cuba and Vietnam, and I'll unpack the conspiracy theories, too, not one of which has ever been conclusively proven. Subscribe to Countdown to Dallas at evergreenpodcasts.com or your favorite listening app, October 31st. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of the new Medal of Honor podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, brought to you in partnership with the National Medal of Honor Museum. In each three-minute episode... We'll learn about a different service member who distinguished him or herself through an act of valor. We'll include stories from the Civil War to Iraq and Afghanistan, and from all branches of the military. We'll talk about service members who were overlooked for the medal at first due to their race or religion, and about those who were celebrated at the time. We'll hear stories of soldiers like Audie Murphy, future Hollywood star who mounted a burning tank to hold off German infantry in World War II, and people like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a Civil War Army doctor and the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor so far. Learn about these heroes and more wherever you get your podcasts. And at the end of the day, this is part of the problem that Wales will have going forward. 
as other forces start to chip away at what was the borders of Wales at its strongest point. And from this time out, the Britons stop calling themselves Britons and start to slowly begin to recognize themselves as different. And in some ways, a lot of this will change dramatically. But for now, this is a key and important role. Griffith is the first and last king of Wales. He is really the only one who united every part of the country from the southeast to the southwest to the northwest to the northeast and everywhere in between. That is something you can't take away from him. That's an achievement that in creating that allowed Wales to grow into a formidable nation, one that would take on the English at an even pace and be able to beat them and in some cases actually win recognition from their English fellows. Had they been able to keep together instead of falling into disrepair and and in the end ending up in a situation where the kingdoms were split again, maybe Wales would be a very different place today and maybe things would have been very different had maybe Harold's ambitions in taking out Griffith had been held off till 1066. William and Griffith may have gotten along. There may have been agreements made between the Norman overlords that may have kept them from taking out the Welsh marches, as they get called later. It may have kept the southwest and southeast united and eventually kept them out of the hands of the Norman lords. But we don't know that. We can't be sure of that. We can't know that if there had been continued to be a king of Wales, that it would have gone any better for them than it did for the Irish and the Scots after them. But what we do know is that with his fall, a number of things then happen. One, his wife is then married to Harold, um, that lasts all of a year because, of course, Harold is killed in 1066. So that being the first issue. Now, was the reason why Edwin did not come to the aid of his uh, brother-in-law because his brother-in-law wasn't necessarily the nicest of people? We don't have a real understanding of who Griffith is. Not really. We have a glowing retrospective given of him in the annals. But if we were to be honest with ourselves and examine the details, it appears to be that he always had difficulty ruling his subjects and that his subjects buckled and, and tried to force him out at different points. This hostility towards his rule may be a sign that he wasn't the nicest of rulers, but let's be honest, most kings in that era weren't. It could also be a case that there was this pining for the older king line or an assumption that Llewellyn and his son were nothing more than usurpers and thus needed to go. You know, we'll, we'll never fully understand because we don't have enough writing from different various people to actually know kind of how this occurred and, and what re legitimately caused this problem for this king. And to be fair, if the Welsh or the Irish annals are correct, and it was actually the son of Iago that kills him, then maybe it's more of a case of somebody who, of supposed allegiance, turned him over to him. I mean, on one occasion, Griffith was actually turned over to and captured by the Norsemen. So we know that this was a fairly traditional situation. We also know that Kinnan was sitting in Dublin, probably stewing, probably fomenting hostility. One of the things that a lot of kings do in this era, especially, is they wipe out other claimants to the throne so as to not have this issue. I mean, look at it later on. We'll talk about Edward I and the way he basically slaughtered all of the claimants to the throne to Gwyneth and effectively put an end to the line that was ruling there. There's this thought process that goes on in these situations where it's like, if I get rid of this guy, then I don't have a problem hanging over my head. And maybe that's the problem. 
maybe fundamentally the issue is is if they'd have killed off Kinnan and some of the other Murfinians, then there wouldn't have been another claimant to the throne. He would have been the only legitimate one. Even Murfin himself killed off anybody who could have contested him. So in a lot of ways, that's probably the problem. And maybe legitimately Griffith just didn't have the ability to do that. Maybe he couldn't kill off Kinnan even if he wanted to. And in that case, you can understand how this happens and how this occurs and how you get trapped into this circumstance. But we know for a fact that this was part of the problem. And certainly there seemed to be some pining for these leaders over and over again, even though he did knock off Huel. He did knock off the other Griffith. He knocked off all these others in Iago. But there was always seemingly a challenger kicking around somewhere. Uh, but nonetheless, it was an amazing and interesting period for Wales, and certainly it's looked back on longingly by those who came after him. And in fact, the annals themselves talk about it in very glowing fashions. And again, as I pointed out, this annal specifically, which is from the, uh, the Brute, talks about it as being one th uh, 1061 as opposed to the 1064 date that Charles Edwards gives it. But it says, 1061 was the year of Christ when Griffith ap Fluellen was slain. After innumerable victories and in taking the spoils and treasures of gold and silver and precious purple raiment through the treachery of his own men, after his fame and glory had increased and after he had aforetimes been unconquered, but was now left in the waste valleys and after he had been head and shield and defender to the Britons. And this is the end of the one true king of Wales, the only king that Wales ever had who ruled the entire country, and in the process both won and lost that control. And unfortunately, no one else will get close. Even the Llewellyns who ruled both Llewellyn the Great and Llewellyn the Last, who were considered to be ruling all of Wales, only ruled the portions that weren't in control of the Marcher Lords, which was most of the south at the point of Llewellyn the Last, and his didn't even really necessarily include all of Paus. So with that in mind, this was an incredible accomplishment, an incredible achievement, and I think if he'd have been able to pass it down to his sons, may have set him aside and may have created a kingdom which may have been, if not a challenger to Britain, being in control of England, it would at the very least have given Wales a much better leg up in the debates and battles to come with the Normans before they arrived. And of course, next time we'll be talking about that arrival and William the Bastard. Until then, uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. And you can always join us up on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And uh, I look forward to any comments you have. And certainly, thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you all next time. Bye bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewellery, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a $100 bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having a lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts.